Season four of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture online at polarinertia.com, and by Press Up, friendly web consultants who listen to your goals and provide solutions that make sense. Online at pressupinc.com. Those 20 odd years ago, you wrote about the confrontation of Autopia, what Rainer Banham called Autopia, and how Los Angeles and this concept of Autopia were squaring off in this kind of a battle. Two decades later, can we definitively say any of those sides, one of those sides, has got the upper hand? The freeways haven't increased in size. Um, the population has, so the freeways are no longer an enjoyable experience. Uh, Did the, you experience them when they were? were. They were. <laughs> not that they ever were, but they're even a little less so now, and there's a lot more tension, and uh, there's a lot more people, and a lot more uh, crowding on them. Um, rush hour used to be pretty predictable. Now it's all day long, every every day, even weekends. And so um, we reached a point where it's kind of a crisis situation on the freeway. It's lost this uh, utopian ideal of, of freedom and, um, and giving us the unlimited uh, access to all parts of, uh, of the region to now being a nightmare. No matter when you, you plan to try, drive, it, it isn't a pleasant prospect. And it had lost that luster 20 years ago, had it not? It had, um, but it's getting worse daily. And mm -hmm. no matter what um, quick fixes are tried, tried on it, adding another lane here and there in the 405 or whatever, those lanes fill up immediately and we're back to gridlock, you know, square one. And it's here amid the ever-worsening freeways of Los Angeles that I'm speaking today on Notebook on Cities and Culture with James Steele. He is a professor here at the USC School of Architecture, where we're sitting. And he's the author of a great many architectural books and monographs. And we reference specifically today a book that came out in 1993, just over 20 years ago, Los Angeles Architecture, The Contemporary Condition. It's a book I've thought about in recent years as, as the 20th anniversary mark approaches. Tell me... In the early 90s, writing this book, why did you begin the book talking about the freeways? This book on architecture begins with a discussion of freeways. Um, there are several reasons. Firstly, the publisher and the editor, um, who I was fortunate to have, was David Jenkins. And it was David that really um, gave me the idea of looking at Rainer Banham and the Autopia idea and so on. Not not necessarily to you know shadow it, but... As, as a way of organizing the ideas about the city. And this is Rainer Bannum of the book uh, Los Angeles, The Architecture of Four Ecologies. Autopia is one, along with Surferbia, the Plains of Id, where I live, and another one whose name is escaping me. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a while. Mm -hmm. But um, that was why I started out that way, at his suggestion, basically. Mm -hmm. And also because it struck me that... Um, oh, the hills. The hills. The whatever, I don't know what he called it, but that's where a lot of architecture is. Yes. Um, it struck me that um, public space is in short supply in Los Angeles, and and really it's the uh, the freeways that are the largest public space in the city. Right, and even even in this book, it, the book is the book I think saw ahead in 1993. I mean, this was of course a time when frustrations with Los Angeles had really really mounted, and in, in many ways already exploded. But you you write in the book about the freeways having entered obsolescence already. I mean, did you, did you believe that uh, the time of obsolescence had already come for the freeways in 1993? Not just the freeways, but the city itself. I mean, uh, uh, as the whole thing. Yeah, the, uh, the freeways are the arteries and the veins of the city. And so they're starting to tatter was a, a kind of an omen or a prophecy of the city itself. How long had you been here uh, when you began this book? In um, I'd been here for two years. I was recruited. I was working in London at the time and recruited to come here, I came here in 91, in the fall of 91. Mm -hmm. There's this sense that a lot of books on Los Angeles from somebody who has just come here should begin with maybe not a scathing critique, but some kind of, some kind of surprised or aghast or, or wrong-footed look at the you know, quote-unquote crazy architecture of Los Angeles, you know, the 30s, the 40s. Mostly pre-war books have this, but... There's, I have the sense that the craziness went away, the craziness during that of Los Angeles before I got here. Is there, is there a sense in which Los Angeles now is 
not crazy enough in some way architecturally? I think um, it's a matter of viewpoint. Uh, many people in Europe, and especially in, in uh, Britain, every time I talk to them about L.A., they always have this image of it being full of um, crazy architecture, crazy mm -hmm. people, and with buildings popping up like mushrooms overnight. Right. And um, it's not necessarily the view that's held in America or necessarily on the West Coast. Um, Los Angeles was always seen as the frontier, um, and it lost that. It's lost that uh, reputation now, I think. Um, and there's a kind of a sadness here. There's a sadness of um, paradise lost or an opportunity lost or the frontier is no longer the west coast of America. And is, is it that? I mean, is it that a building shaped like a hot dog or with a cement donut on the roof no longer can shock anybody? Or the idea itself has just grown weary and blown I think, away? Uh, I think it's grown weary. The idea has grown weary. And I'm not sure why. Um, those buildings had a certain life um, in the city. They were, you know, the 50s and 60s um, were, were full of them. And, and now it's, um, it's no longer, I guess it's no longer easy to shock people. <laughs> it's true. I mean, tell me, though, when you came here in the early 1990s, were you shocked by anything in Los Angeles? Well, I, I say in the book uh, somewhere that everybody in Los Angeles is from somewhere else. Yes. <laughs> um, no one ever really gets used to that. gets used to that. And I think everybody that comes here has their own reaction to this city. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright did, uh, Rainer Bannon did, and so on. And uh, uh, Neutra did, and Schindler did, and so on. So everybody responds in their own way to this city, but it, right. they're all responding to, to the other. I mean, this city is unlike any other city in the world, and it will always, I think, remain that way no matter where you go, you know, this city is unique. Um, and so it has a special character to it. And I was responding to it as, um, in a way, my, my experience has been a lot in the third world. And it reminded me, parts of it reminded me of the third world. So it has this kind of first world, third world, if those are still applicable. Um, kind the of, capital of the third world yeah. designation that was especially big in the 90s. Yeah, exactly right. And what so that's so similar to the third world to you? Um, the, uh, the the balkanization of the city, it was basically, you know, Koreatown and Thai town and Byzantine Latino town. And yes, Byzantine <laughs> Latino <laughs> quarter, yes, yeah. the home of Papa Christos. I, mean, you know, right. I mean, this was one thing. And, and you go into those enclaves and they have, I guess, the I'm not sure of the statistics, but there are, there are a lot of Koreans in Koreatown. Right. I'm not sure if it's more than Seoul, but... Um, there, Seoul's got 25 million, 25 so I don't million, think so. I just came back from there. I can I can attest to. It's not the same as Seoul, <laughs> but it has a lot of it has a lot of um, characters, uh, different character. Mm. You know, it's the balkanization, and in in the end, the very end of the book, Los Angeles architecture, you write about downtown and Broadway, describing Broadway as this third world marketplace, this robust sort of third world commercial street, with the feeling that this is about to go away. This is the end of this era on Broadway. We can see that happening now. Has it happened as fast as you thought, or about, as about, are you slower than you thought, or about what you thought? Yeah, uh, well, the city emptied out, as we know. Uh, talking about Autopia, the, the car and the freeways made it possible for people to move to the suburbs, and so the city basically emptied the, the center core. It was one of the most vibrant and um, I was on track to be uh, like Philadelphia or New York or other cities, San Francisco. Um, but it, because of the decision to give away the train system and go on to the freeways, um, it, it, it emptied out. It, it hollowed out the center. So once that happened, we had you know, a, a different city there. Right. So, so from the war onward, essentially, we have a hollow downtown. Exactly. And, and so the, the lower property values and, and rents drew in another the kind of people there. Mm -hmm. And and that character uh, has remained. When I was uh, looking at it back in the 90s, it seemed to me that it was going to gentrify eventually. Right. And, but that Always on the precipice. Always on the precipice. But the, the, the big problem, Colin, is that the, um, the cost of renovation down there. Right. Any of these uh, loft apartments or whatever the people, Gilmore people have done that, have faced enormous um, uh, financial burden getting them up to code. It's it's true. But the renovations have happened, and I think now we can definitively say 
Yeah, we talked about the downtown revival. We, as in Los Angeles, has talked about the downtown revival every 10 years since the war. Now we can, it's, it's happening now, right? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, I, ah. I think that um, there's a certain inertia about L.A. I'm not sure what it is. If you look at the Grand Street plan and, uh, you know, the, uh, the park plan down there, various other proposals, it's so slow and so incremental. Right. And if you talk to boosters, you know, who will say, well, you know, it's so much better than it was, and we have all these catalytic projects, the Disney Concert Hall and, and so on, but it hasn't really galvanized catalytically galvanized the, the downtown as people thought it would. Right. We should underscore that there's only about 50,000 people living downtown right now, which is a lot more than there were. Ten percent of that is homeless as well. So there are issues to be resolved, but it is... I bring it up because Los Angeles architecture, I mean, it, it's a book that makes criticisms, but you also, correct me if I'm wrong, end it or... An optimistic note carries through in it a little bit, like saying, okay, Los Angeles has had some issues, a lot of this experiment isn't working, but now we know. We know what parts aren't working so well, the single-family houses maybe aren't working so well, the freeways maybe aren't working so well. We know that now in 1993. Now we can move forward. Do you think that, atti that attitude is in that book, looking back, or am I just sort of projecting? Well, I think I was also idealistic. Oh, I <laughs> you know, I just got here, and I was young, younger, and... And basically, um, I was still in that phase where, you know, I used to live in Venice and California, and I would drive home every night after school, and I was still enthralled enough about the city to pull over it on the curb of the freeway and, and look at the sunset, you know. Mm, yes. And um, I remember um, reading Mike Davis back in those days, and I had a sense of uh, ennui when I read him. I mean, he's a native, you know, Angelino as much as anybody is. And there is a, sign, a kind of a... Um, pessimism that, that creeps in after you live here for a while. Right. I mean, in a sense that it's like the reverse, it's the balancing of the booster narrative. Right. The boosters were too much. City of Quartz is arguably too much yeah. on the other side. Yeah. Is that, I mean, yeah. can, can, can that healthily balance out or is this just two sides of the crazy coin? Well, I think if I lived here for another 25 years, I might, <laughs> I might be able to answer that. But sure. I, I, I think there is a kind of a pessimism that creeps in after you live here for right. a while. About what? Uh, the sheer um, uh, inertia um, of the city. I mean, this is the, the entertainment capital of the world, and you have uh, resistance to offering tax breaks to movie studios mm -hmm. to stay here rather than going outside to other states or other, other cities. There's it's a like kind of filming Los Angeles movies in Louisiana exactly. now. Exactly. So there's kind of a lack of appreciation for what this is right. by the people that actually live here uh, that, that gets, after a while, it gets to be very annoying, you know. Inertia is, is right, although, I mean, inertia goes both ways. I, I've had many frustrations, even in the short time I've lived here, about the slow progress of, say, the rail system here. Although, now it, it's moving forward slowly and has some inertia in that sense. It keeps moving forward slowly, albeit a bit too slowly. And I do wonder, it's the same with buildings, uh, even though yeah. they go up quicker than the train system goes up. It's, there's a sense that you wonder what happened to this place where things could seemingly go up overnight. Do you know what I mean? Like, what happened, to the, what happened to that part of Los Angeles where it was reckless? I think it's not just a, a local issue or a state issue. It's, it's a national American issue. I call it the banana mentality. And it's built, <laughs> built absolutely nothing anywhere near anything <laughs> because you might, you know, kill the spotted frog or something. Sure. Um, and this has crept into our society where you can't get the World Trade Center built. Things like the Rockefeller Center are not possible anymore. Robert Moses' kind of attitudes, with all of its faults, you know, had a lot of advantages of being able to build things um, that were that were quite spectacular relatively quickly. Now look at the airport here, the Los Angeles airport. You travel a lot. I do too, and it's and it was uh, really an uh, embarrassment, right? right until yeah, arguably, it remains sometimes an embarrassment. Still an embarrassment. I mean, right. just go to look at a bureau de change, and you know, you know what I mean. Right. But if you go to Guangzhou and look at the airport there. You, I'm sure the people that travel from Asia or other parts of the world here are just immediately struck by how provincial it really is. It's true. I was reading an article by Pico Iyer on, on LAX. He, he stayed there for a couple weeks writing about it in the 90s, in fact, I think probably around the time of Los Angeles architecture. And he was saying it had an odd, hollowed-out feeling considering the city that it brought you into a shabby, hollowed-out kind of a place. Un, un, it was surprising. It was unexpected. And he was saying it had kind of the 
it had the shabbiness of arrogance almost. It was, that was evocative to me. In a lot of ways, Los Angeles in the 20th century had the sense, seemingly, tell me if I'm right or wrong, that, hey, this is Los Angeles. There is no other Los Angeles. You're coming here whether you like it or not, so you're going you're gonna to like whatever the city can afford you infrastructurally. I, I understand that. Um, but there is a kind of a lack of vision uh, generally here that, that strikes you. You know, I wrote a book about uh, William Pereira, uh, who was a, a teacher here, and a visionary, and he was extremely, um, very um, much of a, a, a prophet. He was the one who fought very hard to get Los Angeles Airport the size it is now. To say, well, there'll be jets landing. We need bigger runways and and bigger terminals and 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 so on. But there was such resistance to it, you know. Why didn't Even, they want jets exactly. to land? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it, this is not a new thing. Right. I mean, you wonder what it is about this city that. It's supposed to be this vibrant, exciting center of creativity, yeah. but it isn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's strange because on an individual level, it kind of is that. But on, as a whole, you think, yeah. don't you want jets to land? Don't you want a subway yeah. system? Exactly. Don't you want? It's, right. The individuals are creative. Right. Right. The whole city, what's, what gets between individual creativity and the city as a whole? And you're, you're giving an I don't know motion, but what's your best guess as to what could do that? I guess it's cynicism, uh, and it's not just here. It's in, look at the bullet train idea, which yeah. you know Jerry Brown put forward and was resisted in California, and it makes perfect sense, you know, for us to stay viable as a nation. And this goes nationwide again with uh, Obama trying to get infrastructure changes, which are resisted, resisted. Right. So what is it? It's not just a, a phenomenon that's here. It's a phenomenon in the nation that I think of a postmodern kind of cynicism about any kind of progress not being possible. Right. There's something very uncynical you write about in Los Angeles architecture. After the, after the discussion of the freeways, you write about the case study houses, which, is, which are certainly icons of, if not anti-cynicism, then they're uncynical buildings. For those who haven't heard of them and why they're important here, what are the case study houses? Well, it was an idea by John Intense. It's a brilliant idea. Uh, it was a, he was a publisher who bought California Arts and Architecture magazine and um, and revised it and revamped it into being a modernist kind of pamphlet. And uh, he was very much a card-carrying modernist, and he wanted to convert the nation into these ideas. And he thought that the publishing would be the way to do it. And so he ran a program, which is still a very avant-garde, where um, basically he gave a win-win situation to owners who wanted to build a house. He would help them find a lot. He would find an architect for them that was a case study architect. And so he called this the case study series. Um, the numbers escape me, but there's some more than 50 of them. And um, basically, he also went to contractors and subcontractors and suppliers and offered them to be in his magazine published for free if they would give a discount or even free materials for the houses. And he did the same for the owners. And so, True promotional okay. genius. Though. Promotional genius, yes. totally. And this resulted in houses people will have seen, even if they don't know they've seen them. Right. The Eames House and Pacific Palisades. The uh, tell me what are when you what what are the most recognized case study houses? Do you think? Well, I think that the um, the early days uh, there was a kind of a um, a freedom of frame system, a wood and glass frame, and um, this allowed the architects to to work very freely. There was a, a, a change in the environmental rules in, in California um, with a, a law that restricted the amount of glass that could be used in houses and it came in in the 70s. So it was really the death knell for the case study house. When you take the glass away, you don't have a case study house. Because when we think of them, we think of, say, the Pierre Koenig, uh, I don't know if it's number 22 in the Hollywood, 21, 22, the one in the Hollywood Hills where you see that iconic photo of yeah. the lady sitting with the highballs. Yeah. And it's all glass looking out over the entire city, that kind of thing. You need that to have a real, what yeah. people think of as a case study house. Yeah, yeah. totally. And, and now, well, the 1970s was the death knell for it. Yes, it's... But, you know, I think of that photo, the photo of that Koenig house now, and the case study houses, that one and the others, are they're very hard to dislike. I think it's everybody who sees them, even if that's not the kind of house they want to live in, they have some appreciation for, oh, that's, that's something I, I don't often see. That's a house that, hey, wh why don't we have more houses like that? But, and there's reasons for that. But, you know, part of, part of my reaction to that is, is always, 
In, in Los Angeles architecture, you write about, you refer to the case study house program and its failures. Not, not necessarily dismissing the whole program as a failure, but it didn't, it didn't accomplish the goal of creating house, houses that could be mass produced to solve the housing shortage at the time. And even if we're talking about it just in aesthetic terms and in terms of the houses that do exist, that came out of the case study program, I personally am always torn. I appreciate aesthetically these houses, but say that Koenig house overlooking the city, mm. cool. But I'd rather be in the city. It's it, it's it, how do I how do I put it? It's it's like why is the city down there? You know, I, well, why is it? Why are the houses so far? They're all so far away from Los Angeles. It seems like what they're they're in the Palisades or they're I mean the, the Eames house I'll probably never see because it's all the way up there. That's it's just they're in parts of the city you don't interact with. Does that make sense? They, I think the appeal to those of those houses, and I've seen them, you know, I was in Tokyo a couple of months ago and on a train and a Japanese businessman was reading a manga magazine and there was the Koning House. <laughs> <laughs> Number 22. Well, that's not, that's not the one I would expect to see in I know, that. I know. But I think they, they capture the essence of the era right. and they also capture the freedom of that time and the kind of beneficent climate we have where you can be outside right. and inside and outside architecture. It captured that. And it took modernism to a new level. Uh, the Eames' house, for example, is a, is a step in a different direction from the classical modern house of Germany right. where they, they humanized it. And they, you know, most of these houses have swimming pools and it's kind of hard to imagine Mies van der Rohe in a bathing suit. I mean, <laughs> you know, yes. the, the modern masters didn't have time for fun or, right. or pleasure. They weren't hedonists. They were serious about changing the world. And so the case study house took that to Californiaize the, the modernism. But also, Los Angeles is a city of voyeurs. You know, this is a, this is a city that looks at movies and, and so on. Right. And so the houses typically frame the distance, you know. They, they capture that aspect of this culture as well, of, of not being a, in the city, being looking at the city. So that's, that's really what they, they, um, they personify. What does it mean? That there is, there was for so long and still is in many respects a desire for that, for the city to be your background, not to be your setting. I don't know. I mean, I think it might be the, the noir um, genre, you know, the, uh, the movies and the, and the, and the novels, mm -hmm. that always, that, where the city is always a sonography. It's not actually something you participate in, it's, it's the, the stage set for your life. And to an extent, it happens with buildings right there downtown as well. People complain a lot, architects especially, about the tendency of downtown to host you know, fortresses. Uh, you write in Los Angeles Architecture about the Walt Disney Concert Hall, not yet built at that time, but you, you talk about uh, Gary's designs for it, you show a model. It, it's, often, it's often cited as a building that, while not as fortressy as some, is still... I mean, my, my canonical example of a fortress is the Bonaventure downtown. It has, it could be anywhere. It doesn't care where it is, especially that it's in downtown Los Angeles. The Disney Concert Hall is an improvement, but why are these, why have the, why are there so many fortresses downtown? Well, it's a dangerous place. <laughs> <laughs> so these days, you know, um, it's still, don't is. go there at all. I mean, uh, I mean you know, <laughs> but it, it still is. I mean, uh, people, um, don't want to venture out too much after dark in any part of downtown. Um, but, the Disney concert hall is kind of a dichotomy because Gary, uh, you know, he's a, his politics um, are toward inclusion, you know, including everyone. Mm -hmm. And he wanted that building to be um, inclusive so that not to exclude the, you know, the lower classes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to create what he called uh, a building with his skirts lifted up on the edges <laughs> so that people could go underneath. I mean, that image is kind of dicey. But basically... Um, he saw it as being socially accessible, right. but his buildings in general are object buildings, and sometimes and, literally with object, literally with objects yeah. put in front of them, and they're hard to really contextualize. Right. You know, you can't really cozy up to a Frank Gehry building; you might get cut. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so the the whole the whole genre, uh, his genre, is 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 based on the idea of an object, a fortress in space. You know, it's. I mean, I think back to the, what you said about downtown Los Angeles, that it's dangerous, and it still has many elements of danger to it versus other parts of Los Angeles. But, you know, I think of New York in the 1970s was not a safe place either. Why, why has New York lost so much of that threat and Los Angeles retains the sense that it is threatening? 
I don't know. I, I, I think um, there's a gang culture here. Um, you know, even on the, around this campus, it's, it's not the safest place in the world. Mm. And USC is one of the, you know, most uh, prestigious universities in the world and, 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 and the largest in, in the country. And yet, you know, there's danger everywhere in this city. It's, it's, uh, it's not just confined to downtown. It's true. I mean, I've, I've never felt particularly unsafe downtown, but USC seems to get this siege mentality as well every so often that it's, it's curious that, as you say, one of the most prestigious universities in America is surrounded by an area that some regard as, I won't go there day or night, let alone, you know, it's, how, how, how does that, what, what about Los Angeles makes that situation possible where those two, one of those things can be within the other thing? I don't, I'm not a sociologist, but yeah. um, I, I know that that hollowing out that took place in downtown happened here as well. I mean, if you look at the first buildings in the university, they were these, these wonderful little clabbered houses. And, <laughs> um, and, and now it's, you know, be, because of that cultural shift, a social shift that took place, it's in the middle of a different kind of demographic. How much of the Los Angeles, well, I'll put it this way, how much of the Los Angeles today that surrounds us would have surprised you in the, at the time you were writing Los Angeles architecture, be it buildings, be it the infrastructure, or be it the sort of social conditions here? Is there anything that would have, that I, if I went back in time and told you about Los Angeles today, you would not really believe me? Uh, no, I mean, it's, in my view, it's gone uh, it's it's um, diminished. Mm. The city, what would have surprised me is the extent to which it didn't live up to its potential or didn't live up to the dream ah. that I had when I got here. It's it's more or less a nightmare now. Really, it's it's interesting. That's I would say it's you you have one of the one of the more I don't want to say it's. Pessimistic. Pessimistic, maybe, but you're, you're, you're diagnosing the current conditions, so unless, I mean, uh, I want to get a sense to draw a contrast, because this is a time where a lot of people are optimistic about Los Angeles, so I think it's especially valuable to figure out what, what, you, what exactly you find, you think, you suspect went wrong, that others see going right. Uh, where, where do you f find the most disconnect with sort of the commentary on Los Angeles going I think right? it's, uh, uh, as, an, as, as an observer of the architecture, the architectural scene, when I came here, there was there was an excitement, um, and I was caught up in this um, myth of you know Cyark and the, you know the Los Angeles School and right. Frank Gehry and Morphosis and all these stars all of the book stars, Los Angeles architecture. You know, yes. and Eric Moss and mm -hmm. Neil Denari, you know, and and I thought that there would be, as with uh, Philadelphia, where I came from, I I was a part of the Louis Kahn School, you know, the Philadelphia School, and out of that there came a lot of disciples, and they. They didn't change the city, but they changed architecture. They they had a big impact on the way architecture works, mm -hmm. and so the um, the surprise for me was that that didn't take mm -hmm. that there was no follow on. I mean, Tom Mann is now, you know, he's I guess a year younger than I am, and he's you know he's having hip surgery, and you know, <laughs> and 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 Frank Gehry um, has kind of a, a, been in exile from L.A. Mm -hmm. because of the Disney Concert Hall going to Bilbao, and then becoming a superstar after that, and mm -hmm. Never looking back, so the voice of the city is lost. Uh, Frank Gehry, the the prophet of the city, is lost, and Eric Moss is now the dean of um, Cyark. And because he's more or less built out, Culver City is no longer, um, you know, active designer. Mm -hmm. So that promise was um, very exciting, and it and it and it is gone. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is something that happens with every? wave of people who come here that they see a promise and then are disappointed no matter when they get here, be it the 30s, be it the 70s, be it the 90s, they see something here and then they they slowly find themselves jaded. Is that a phenomenon you think goes on? I don't know. I think um, that uh, I talk, talking, I mean, I'm, I know I'm not on speaking, you know, intimate speaking terms with Frank Gehry, but I've interviewed him and uh, I know Tom Main and um, Eric Moss well. Um, and they all decry that idea of the L.A. school. You know, they say it was, it was a myth. It wasn't really true. It was a, it was a media creation. It was a kind of a perception. However, it was a powerful, a powerful trope, you know. And, and if you came into L.A., if I were coming into L.A. today, I'd be hard-pressed to identify who the new hot architects are. You know, there, I know there's a, a lot of 40 under 40, you know, firms that are really powerful. 
um, in their own right, but there's no kind of cohesion. There's no translation of the zeitgeist of the city the way that they, they translated it. You could actually feel the energy that they saw in the city in their work, right. where today you don't see any energy. Nobody's representing the zeitgeist of the city because no one knows what it is? It doesn't have one. Mm, it doesn't. It lost its zeitgeist somewhere along the line. Can you point to the time the zeitgeist went away? Uh, I don't know. Um, it would be hard to say that. Um, I, I think it, there's a cumulative effect of um, kind of um, resistance in the wire. Mm. You know, the, the energy that used to go through the wire, the cumulative effect of, of, of the resistance in that wire just got to the point that it didn't happen overnight. Mm. I think it happened incrementally. Mm. You know? what, what did that Los Angeles school represent to you in the 1990s? You know, what, what zeitgeist did you see represented there when you were first here? I think it was a rawness and an energy and a passion for, you know, exploring and pushing the edges. Um, each one of those architects did it in, in different ways, but they, they had a cumulative identity. You know, if you looked at the work, you could see it in all, in, in, in a, as, a, as, a, as a body. You could see it there. Um, they, they each had their own approach and their own ideas, but I think that um, it just represented a kind of raw edge that, that the city at that time seemed to have as well. When traveling these days, where do you see, do you see that raw edge somewhere else in some other country or city? Is, is the edge there, not here? I can't help but think that Asia yeah. is where it's gone. I'm I mean, going there more and more often, too, so how can I disagree? Los Angeles was the new frontier, and it's always been that for Americans because they, they've always looked at progress going west, and at once Ohio was the frontier. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Uh, then, the, then, the, then the Mississippi and you know St. Louis and the Arch and then, and so on and so on. And L.A. was the final frontier. Listen to California Dreaming, you know, and and um, it's now gone across the Pacific to China, and uh, not Japan but China. Mm. When what do you what are you seeing when you go over to Asia? What what places? What types of projects stick out to you? It's really representative of the fact that the energy is now there. Well, I, I spent a lot of time in Japan, and I spent a lot of time in China, both, and Malaysia as well. Um, and I, what I see is that kind of excitement and energy that used to be here in terms of trying to, you know, push the envelope and try new things and, um, and try to um, and discover new, new frontiers. And it's not so much um, stylistic anymore because the digital revolution, when I first came here, wasn't yet it, it going full force. Mm -hmm. You have to remember that Tom Main didn't really, you know, um, embrace the computer until the mid '90s. He, at one point, there was this dramatic day. Everybody there in the office remembers it, where he came in and said, "Okay, all, all the drawing boards out," <laughs> you know, and he moved in new desks, and everybody had to learn how to do, use computers. Okay. One day conversion. Yeah, oh and with Frank Gehry, it was the um, impossibility of actually drawing the, the Disney Concert Hall plans and sections. So somebody in the office said, well, what about airplane technology? Well, you know, what about Katia and this Dassault system that use, they use with handheld probes? And they started to explore with that, and that's how they actually got those, the, the, the drawings done for the Disney Concert Hall. Mm -hmm. So there was this digital revolution that started to take place, but it didn't really catch on until the mid-90s, actually 96, 98, like that. And so late in the 90s at that point. Exactly. And even though, you know, computers were used, obviously, in the early 80s, you know, and, and so on. Um, so that revolution in architecture has had something to do with it, too, where we now have a kind of homogeneous kind of uh, world architecture. Um, so it's, it's taken away the regional kind of um, identity mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's spread it out over the entire world. Reading books about Tokyo and Los Angeles written over the past 30, 40 years, sometimes I see them analogize one city to the other, compare one city to the other, saying, you know, they're both these collections of villages. They're both, they're both in a way like a body where each cell is its own sort of city, and they come together to form a larger version of itself. And they'll write about Tokyo. This still happens in Tokyo today, as I understand it, you know. Buildings go up and down so quickly you'll get lost if you spend a few months outside the city. They said that about Los Angeles at one time, but it's strange to think that Tokyo would keep going apace, and Los Angeles, the much, much newer city, would be the one to slow down, isn't it? Um, I think it has to do, there is a, there are superficial similarities between the two, uh, formally, but there are deeper 
cultural differences too that have to do with Buddhism and, and the idea of transience and change and, and Zen uh, especially and also Shinto where basically there's no uh, expectation of permanence. In LA, um, you know, I, 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 um, I always joke that, you know, something that's 30 years old is ancient. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, you get these, you get these battles here to preserve drive-in coffee shops, and I'm, I think, yeah, I, those are pretty cool, but that's not what the city is. Is it keep, keeping hold, you know, holding on for dear life for these things that the, the builders didn't even mean to last this long in the first place? You know? Yeah, I, I, I think it's, the, the similarities are, 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 are evident, but there is a, a significant cultural difference. Here, it's a matter of um, boredom with history. <laughs> you know, it's not so much about any kind of Buddhist or Shinto ideals. Right. It's about just being um, everything is yesterday if it's if it's not current. If you were to do a new edition of Los Angeles architecture, I mean, what's the first what's the first thing that changes? What's the first thing that needs expanding? What comes to your mind as this is going to need? This is going to need some changes because I mean it's been since what ninety eight was the last edition of the book. Instead of starting with uh, Utopia, I, I think the first sentence would be, "Los Angeles is like a, a psychiatric patient that needs occasional checking, <laughs> and you have to constantly, uh, you know, take its take the temperature and and, and do uh, do the CAT scan." Yes. And and if I had to give this prognosis for this patient. It's on life support. It would be a book with a different tone. That it would, it would be a book, as, as I say, Los Angeles architecture, in its most recent edition, is it's not all smiles, but it has optimism to it. Now you're essentially you would be viewing, you'd be viewing the decline of a place through its architecture. How do you do that? The rise and fall of LA, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, I know what you say. I know what you're saying. I mean, I. I, I'm a magazine junkie, mm -hmm. both online and, and, and the actual hard copies. Mm -hmm. And every time I pick up a magazine with an article about LA, it's, oh, all the creative talent, oh, all the young people, look what's happening here, look what's happening there. But it's so atomized, you know. There's no coordinated vision about what this city can be or where it should be going. Nobody has that kind of, um, that kind of uh, vision that the, that the Los Angeles school had. I mean, if I can call them that, and, and they don't, don't really describe them, but they all seem to have a um, a uh, an idea of changing this place for the better and and making it um, into the brave new world. Now there is no belief in a brave new world. Mm -hmm. I think we've gotten to this stage where there is no kind of um, passion or or optimism mm -hmm. for the future here. This was the center of optimism. Now it's uh, it's not. How much of it has to do with Los Angeles simply being too big to have a vision for? Uh, that could be it, but it's always been spread out. Right. You know, it's always been, I mean, relative to size. It's always had the same structure, eight cities in search of a center or seven, or depending on who you talk to. I think it might have to do with um, just the sheer demographic changes, too. The fact that uh, it's now a, um, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, it has a feeling of burden to it. Mm -hmm. You know, the, being the, the burden for for um, for su providing survival, you know, it's on survival mode. It's not on um, not on um, chasing a dream. Mm. You mentioned the atomization of what goes on here, and yeah, when I read about Los Angeles now or, or talk to people about it, often they do frame people frame what they like or what they're looking forward to in terms of very specific areas. Yeah. Maybe they like what's going on in Silver Lake. Maybe they like what's going on in downtown or Koreatown where I am or Culver City indeed still. It's, it's something that makes, I don't know, personally my experience of the city is pretty good. And then I question myself and I'm thinking, well then am I experiencing Los Angeles or am I, am I experiencing a dozen places individually that I go to when I'm calling that Los Angeles? You know, how do you answer the question of knowing when you're experiencing Los Angeles and when you're just experiencing the atoms? I, we have a, a dean here, this Chinese. He came into uh, office in 2007. Mm -hmm. So he's now been here for you know, seven years or, you know, um, and he comes from Shanghai. And I can't help but think. <laughs> I often have this fantasy in my head. He doesn't spend a lot of time <laughs> in, in his office, you know. He's always on a plane to Shanghai, and I know why. Mm. You know, if I had a choice of L.A. or Shanghai to live in, I'd be in Shanghai in a heartbeat. Even I mean, with the air? <laughs> even with the air. Oh, I mean, my. because the sheer excitement and innervation of that city 
you know, compared to this city. This city is so sad. It's so tragic. It's just, you know, come on, Culver City, you know, <laughs> this is uh, Nirvana. I mean, you know, it's got two blocks, a couple of movie theaters, and everybody's excited. Uh, you know, what is, um, I think if you're so desperate to kind of make uh, the best out of something, that you, you think that that is is really exciting. I, I feel sorry for you, you know? I just, yes. you know? I know what you mean. It's it's one of this, I think even Los Angeles enthusiasts have this, have this issue, have this dilemma where they, half of their enthusiasm comes from criticizing the problems of Los Angeles, even if half is genuinely, they genuinely enjoy what they're doing here. I mean, I could say the same for myself. I. I don't have to live in Los Angeles, but moved here out of being fascinated by it. And yeah, the conversations I have, even with people who say they love Los Angeles, uh, which I don't say, but I do find it very fascinating. A lot of the time, they're they're really not necessarily negative about it, but they're very, very, very critical of it. And in a way, I like that because it's different in maybe. I don't want to pick on San Francisco, but even like San, San Francisco and New York, you're, if you go there and say what's wrong with the place, you're going to have, you might get into a fight. You know, yeah. it's 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 the, he, Los Angeles accepts criticism even if it doesn't learn from it, right? You no, know, I, I believe that, and and they either love the city or hate it. And I started loving it. I'm not in the hate column yet, but you kind of have to do both, though, don't you? you ultimately, do. you do. I mean, it still has its moments for me. I have two sons, uh, probably older than you. And, and my older son, who loves the city, and every time we meet, you know, we have this conversation. Dad, why don't you like Los Angeles? I love Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what do you um, tell him when he says, why don't you like Los Angeles? I don't know. I'm just over it, I guess. <laughs> it's like, um, I, I think that it's the traveling that, gets, that, that does it for me. Go to Kuala Lumpur. The next time you go to Asia, go to Kuala Lumpur. Mm. Go I want to go to Kuala Lumpur. Go to Jakarta, you know. Um, Tokyo, where you've been to, you know, Shanghai, Guangzhou. My God, this is life on steroids. And right. and once you travel to them, to those cities, and and then come back here, this is really sad and pathetic. <laughs> I, I see what you mean. I mean, I just came back from Seoul myself. I was in Korea six weeks recording interviews on this show, and I do I did have a lot of moments there, and I, even in Japan, where it was like, why don't we have that in Los Angeles? Why don't we have that in Los Angeles? Everything from the vending machines yeah. to 12 subway lines. At the same time, the homogeneity of those places bothers me. You know, you know, you know what I mean. It's no, that no, no. that that would get to me in the way that Los Angeles things get to me. Los Angeles's problems get to me. Uh, so the only conclusion I've come to is I have to split my time half in Asia, half here, which is kind. Of, it seems like you're maybe more in Asia now, but that's that's a way to live here. It seems like it'd be away no, half the time. And Asia's coming to us, you know. Yeah, that's true. So uh, I mean, look at little Tokyo and so on, but. It's such a pathetic little reproduction of Asia, you know, <laughs> that uh, little Tokyo, the people that live down there, trying desperately to recreate something they have in Asia. You have to think of it not as a recreation of Asia and as its own thing. That's at that point, it's 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 it can't help but disappoint if you think little Tokyo is literally <laughs> little Tokyo. <laughs> but does does that is it not? I mean, I, how do I frame this? I was going to ask: Is the is the fact that, is, that Los Angeles is so non-homogenous, is that not a draw for you? I think back to Los Angeles architecture, and you frame it as that might be a reason the city has struggled, is that it is so diverse. Yeah. But is there a sense in which that's also an attraction here? It is, um, but you have to embrace the car. You know, if, if I've some, you know, there are 20-foot waves in, on Malibu today, you know, and I was thinking I, I would go and see them after this interview, you know. But you got to get in a car to go to do it. Uh, that's why Malibu is not on my map. Doesn't have a car. And you know, if there's I hear there's this great um, Vietnamese sandwich in, in in you know Glendale that I should go and try. But you got to go to Glendale to get it. Then you you're know? out of Los Angeles. <laughs> exactly. And you know, or downtown. I just read about a great new restaurant down there, Republic. And you know, you gotta, well, it's not that new, but um, you know, you've got to travel. Right. No matter where you want to go, the, 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 the saying in Los Angeles is everything's half an hour away. However you get there, bicycle, right. whatever. But the, the public transport system, if it was like Tokyo or London, yeah, you know, it wouldn't be that bad. But it's such a, a difficult thing to actually negotiate now with the freeways and everything else. You just think, oh, I won't bother. You know. Right. There's, there's that as well. And I mentioned Malibu being off my map. I guess there are certain parts of Los Angeles that just don't appear in my calculus because they're too hard to get to. And I don't really 
sit there and miss them. I don't really think I, you know, I'm probably missing things by not going to Malibu, but I don't, I'm not necessarily thinking about it. And it makes me wonder, you know, in the 90s, I watch a lot of 90s Los Angeles movies, and there's, with understandably, a lot of them have this sense Los Angeles is about to erupt into a race war. Uh, there's this huge class divide. There's the rich, rich white people on the west side and their fortresses, everybody else scattered around the plains of Id, you know. Mm-hmm. The sense of that there's more than one city and these cities don't communicate. Like, there's, there's Los Angeles 1, Los Angeles 2, far below it. It seems now, you know, I think of, when I think of where I can go in Los Angeles, and increasingly, maybe it's generational, I talk to people younger than me, and what comes up in their mind, what's on their radar, what's on their mental map is the, is what they can get to easily. Right. It is downtown, it is maybe Pasadena, it's right. whatever's on the expo line. And those lines, it's, it's really transit based or where you can get on a bike. And those tend to be the densest parts of Los Angeles as well, or the densifying parts, which leads me to wonder, will there come a time when there are two Los Angeleses, the dense one and the non-dense one, and the, the, the twain do not meet? Do you know what I mean? Is that plausible? It's plausible. It's an interesting idea. I never thought about it. But I think that the thing we talked about earlier about the resistance to change in mm-hmm. the public transport system, for example, which, you know, the investment is there, but it's so bloody expensive now, you know. Right. One mile costs a billion dollars or something. Like that. And it's not going to change anytime soon. They're talking about the the line to um, Santa Monica being finished in three years. We'll see if that works. But right. so it takes such a long time. Mm. Uh, and it's the travel that makes it hard. So a friend of mine, I just met her, actually, and uh, on a plane. And she was she was going to um, Long Beach. She was visiting friends there. She's from Miami. And invited me down to, you know, to meet her. And I, I said, no, I'd rather not. <laughs> it's 45 minutes in the freeway. And I was thinking, you know, so you lose connections and friends. Right. So you're, you're, you're basically your social network is, is heavy, but your actual network isn't. Right. It's, it's one of those reasons that it seems like it's one of the reasons I see that, that kind of looming divide because when, when a newcomer comes to Los Angeles, I find they do go to this denser Los Angeles in the middle. And it's, I don't really know if it's a generational difference for prefer, preference of density in terms of living or whatnot, but it's one of those reasons that the case study house program gets considered a failure, isn't it? Because it couldn't address density? No, that wasn't the reason it failed. Um, I mean, that was a problem with it, though, that it could never... No, it, right, it, it couldn't address density, right? It was one of the reasons it, it didn't catch on, but it, it, it failed for deeper reasons, I think. A more... A more um, Systematic reason. Mm. What, what, do, what do you put it down to? Well, I was fortunate enough to have um, Pierre Koning was here when I came here, mm-hmm. and so we uh, I did a book on him with David Jenkins, and um, I got to know him fairly well and and visit his projects and so on. And what Rainer Banham calls the the uh, style that nearly yes. you know, dot dot dot. <laughs> it was a style that nearly because Koning had this vision early on of mass producing houses for the public. That could be met, that could be built in an assembly line, and they were you know steel and glass and bolt them together and bingo. Now it's a style that you know time has come. Um, people like Marmol Radzinger and so on are doing houses, selling them online for extraordinary amounts of money. Um, my son was thinking of getting one until he looked at the price tag, you know. And there, so it hasn't yet come down to the being the Volkswagen of the of the architectural market. But um, Pierre Coding was way ahead of his time. So uh, America, people in America weren't, you, weren't ready to live in a steel house, a steel and glass house yet. That's why it failed. It just, we could just say something as simple as it was ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah exactly right. How many ahead of its time, ahead of their time architectural ideas really happen here? Maybe not today, but has, this been, has Los Angeles been a city that has hosted more too far ahead of its time ideas that have, that have sank in that way besides the case study houses? Yeah, um, I'm just putting together a history of the school for the school, and it's going to be out in November. Mm. And um, it's taken me five years to put it together. But, um, yeah, the, this school has kind of been a hotbed for that, that kind of thing. It doesn't look like a hotbed <laughs> compared to Cyrus or something. But it has, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of new ideas come out of here, and in and, uh, and Los Angeles, too. Um, so yes, there have been a lot of ideas that have been broached in LA. What are some of the most fascinating architectural ideas to you that have come out of here, out of, out of the USC School of Architecture? 
I think they're mainly to do with materiality and systemization. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at Conrad Voxman or Rafael Soriano or you know anybody like that, they've all been looking at how to move move the ball forward. In in uh, Frank Gehry also, to be honest, in the beginning, uh, they were tired of this kind of conventional stick built kind of way of building that we take from the colonial period, you know, balloon frame houses and all of that, and looking at a new way of breaking the mold and, and coming into the 20th century, then the 21st century, of building in a, in a way that, that matches the technology and uh, the scientific processes that are available. Mm. With, working with students, the students you have here today, what sense do you have of their attitude toward Los Angeles and its built environment? Um, hard to say. I mean, it's you know they're they're uh, students, so they're they're excited by a lot of things. <laughs> you know, they're easy to excite. Sure. Um, but they're I think their uh, their bucket gets full really fast. You know, mm. in terms of looking around and checking off the boxes of things that they should see and know about. Mm. So um, we have a very cosmopolitan and sophisticated group of students today. They come from all over the world. We have the largest... As you say, Asia comes to you in many exactly. senses. We have the largest foreign population of any school in America, mm -hmm. in a, the USC. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when they, they compare where they've come from to here, it's, oh, oh um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> is it always that? Is it always ho oh, hum? I have to imagine just because it is so different from the places they come from, there is some core fascination there. I mean, for a lot of people who come here who even don't like Los Angeles that much, they say, well, it is, yeah, sure. it is different. No, sure. I mean, as I said, you know, uh, I, I do remember vaguely being 22, and I'm sure you do. You know, and, and anything excites you when you travel and, and you soak it up and you learn. And, and so I'm sure they're, they're excited about it. And we do our best to, to get them into the, um, all of the sites in the city architecturally that we're seeing. And so I'm sure that, that interests them, excites them, and so on. But students today in general are very, Hard to impress mm. because they, you know, they've seen everything, done everything. They travel a lot. They're very sophisticated. You know, they start flying when they're like twelve or something, <laughs> and so they, they're, they're more um, urbane mm. than they were in the past. Well, how, how different were the impressions the first time you came to Los Angeles versus the first time you did some serious architectural examination of Asia? You know, when you first were there, as opposed to when you first were here, were they, were they similar kinds? of excitement you might have had about the Los Angeles school and about what's going on in China and Japan, Malaysia, and so on? It was excitement com combined with confusion. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think I operate, the reason I write is to learn myself. Mm -hmm. There, you know, there's this idea that, you don't, you know, if you write a book, you're an expert on something. <laughs> That's the British idea. You know, you, you spend your entire life studying, I don't know, somebody like Canatello or Canatello. But basically, um, I, I write to, to teach myself and then to use what I've learned to teach others, mm. my students. And, um, and so I, I approach things with, you know, skepticism and yeah. <laughs> a little bit of curio a lot of curiosity and, and, and the confusion. When I came here, it was a lot of that. I mean, I, I was excited by this place. And I, as I said, I, you know, I used to look at palm trees and go crazy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, I don't anymore. But, um, that, that's what happened in Asia too. It's trying to figure out what makes a place tick. You know, you go to Tokyo and think, what is it about? What, what is going on here? Right. So you try to dig deeper and deeper and deeper until you understand the structure. Mm -hmm. And that's, what I, that's the way I operate with, it, with any place I go to. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, it's easier to see that structure, is it not, if you, if you can get past the sort of rapture of be it with a palm tree, be it with a sunset, or be it with, be it with anything. You have to, would you, would you say you have to get past that, uh, that honeymoon with yeah. the place to really see it? It's a scientific outlook. I mean, mm -hmm. And being a you know scientific objectivity, but there's also the other side of the brain that, that that's the subjective part. Mm -hmm. So you balance them, and the, I think that that book, the Los Angeles book, you know, it's it's some of the best writing I've done, I think. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that from various other people too. And I think that's because I was excited by this place, and and the subjective part of me was deeply, you know, moved by it and um, and fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. It takes that. It takes the, the excitement of that subjective part of you to bring you to the subject in any case. And then you have to, you have to see it a little more. I mean, now in the state you're currently in, your current relationship to Los Angeles, you could write about it pretty objectively, I would imagine. Yeah, I or so. is it too far the other direction where it's, yeah, you're not I wonder, objective again? I wonder if, if I'm too bitter. <laughs> 
you know, having my house broken into three times. And, three times. And my car also. And, you know, and like, you know, multiple accidents that weren't my fault. And, mm. you know, after a while, you get inured mm. to, to, the, to the paradise. Right. Um, and, and you think about the negative side. But I, I do, I think I'm capable of being objective. And I do intend to write another book about it. Mm. I'm not sure if it's going to be a book or an article for a magazine or something. Um, for you know, British magazine or something. What, are the, what question would you want to answer in that? What question are you looking for the answer to that would make you write, whether it is a book or an article? Well, I, I think it's, uh, can I get across this idea of the, the way the city has moved, mm. um, how it's transitioned in the 20 years, that, it's 24 years I've been here. Mm. You know, I, I think it has changed. Mm. Uh, it's, something's changed, some things stay the same, right. as the French say. But I, I think that uh, the changes have been dramatic What's, what's the starkest? The demographic shifts, I think, mm. uh, and, and the impact that's had on the city. Um, and Just pure diversification? Yeah. I mean, it was always a diverse city, but I think that that's tipped, you know. Uh, it's tipped a bit, and it's not tipped to the, to the point where it's noticeably changed the form of the city, mm. um, but it's tipped in the way that um, the attitude of the city, I think. Could it change the form of the city, this, the, this growing, ever-growing diversity here? Well, I think it changes it in many, in many different ways. We talked about Broadway. You know, I think that eventually it will gentrify. Um, it's not going to gentrify. At, at one point, I had hoped it would be, you know, because the, the architectural um, treasures down there are so amazing. I forget how many theaters there are, 28 or 30, that are just rotting away. And if, if somebody could come in there and make a you know, proposal to do the entire street and save them, that way. I think that would be great. As an architect, it won't be so great for the people there right. who will be displaced and, and have to find a new place to live. And this, this is true all over the city. There, there's a constant shifting and displacement happening. Mm. And it's, it's happening for, you know, uh, in the other way too. I mean, so there's a class structural, a, a structural class division that's taking place. It does seem with the current wave of optimism about Los Angeles, there's definitely room for something contrarian. I mean, do you, can, you, can you see yourself feeling that spot? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I could do that. Um, mm -hmm. Because everybody, seem, everybody thinks that they have to be a booster, really. You know, mm -hmm. That this is the tradition of the city. You know, it's the great place to live. And I was watching um, you know, on Netflix last night something. Maybe I shouldn't mention the show, but it was about kids in Seattle homeless kids, and, and there's this one character who's going to go to Los Angeles and change his life and become a star. And, you know, there's still that mystique of the city that you, know, you can come here and change your life. Right. You can come here and reinvent yourself, and you can still do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I did, <laughs> and, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright did, and various other people did. Right. Um, but um, the reinvention now is harder because um, it's, there's a cynicism that um, you have to buy into to do that. Mm -hmm. These other cities that impress you around the world, does personal reinvention go on in them as well? No. No. Um, it's harder mm. because of class structure and, and uh, tradition and so on. Mm. You know, if you look at Tokyo, if, you know, it's a xenophobic culture for a start, and if you come in as an outsider, you're, you're already in the margins. Right. But you can reinvent yourself that way. People, Westerners go there for that reason. They, they start over with this when they're on, they, they can stay on the outside in some sense. Yeah, you know, I forget the name of the guy who um, is a, you know, he's a, he's on the, on the talk shows all the time, mm -hmm. and he, he speaks fluent Japanese, but he's, he's from Chicago or something, I forget. Mm, yes, and, you get those type of celebrities yeah, in these yeah, countries. Blonde hair, and, <laughs> and um, you know, Dave, Dave Son, they call him. Mm. And um, he's a curiosity, but he's uh, so adapted to the culture that he's accepted. But no matter what you do, in Japan, you'll always be an outsider mm -hmm. if you're not Japanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here, it's everybody is sort of foreignerized in a way, right? Everybody is an outsider. Exactly. Does that make sense? That's true, exactly. That's why you have the freedom mm -hmm. to do what you like. So there is relative freedom here, although you know it's get becoming more circumscribed. Mm -hmm. I do often think finally about what I would change about Los Angeles, even though I'm pretty happy with my experience of Los Angeles. I do think what's one thing I would do if I could just snap my fingers. I would probably, I'd keep the amount of things the same in Los Angeles. I would, you know, have all the distances if I could snap my fingers and make everything 
half as far apart as it is now. I'm not saying that would solve a lot of problems, but I think it would. It might solve some. It might solve some personal gripes I have with how far apart things are. Is there something you think about? You fantasize about. Well, if this one thing could change, maybe I would have less of a problem with Los Angeles. Some sort of core issue you could snap away and see, just to see what. Just that would make you curious to see what happened as a result. Well, you know, uh, I also spent a lot of time in London, mm -hmm. and even though that the underground is. Yeah, Victorian, yes. <laughs> right? Uh, Two of those lines are like UNESCO World Heritage Sites, right? They can't yeah, do anything to them. Exactly. <laughs> but they still function mm -hmm. uh, really Not well. Not to hear Londoners tell it, but... Yeah. Uh, even unless there's the wrong kind of snow or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you, you never hesitate if, if you're... And, and in Tokyo as well, the subway system is brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to kind of get adapted to it and understand the, the way it works, but... Eventually, you don't even blink about you know going from one part of the city to the other. Uh, you know, if you wake up one morning and you think, you know, I'd like to go to Wayno and look at the museums, and you just get on the subway and go. And and here you can't. And I think that's the one thing that holds the city back. Mm -hmm. It's the, the the failure, you know, to um, that it had back in the day uh, to see that it should hang on to its mass transit and and develop that um, and not buy into this seductive the seduction of the car. Mm, or to you know build one underground. I'm not. I'm less worried. I'm less uh, broken up than some about the red cars going away because I do hear they were slow. But it's about transit then, right? Yeah. Mm. Because every now and then I'd like to go to Venice again and see some friends, and you know it's just a drive. And, right. Yes. You know. <laughs> When, when we're all dead, <laughs> maybe this will be possible. We can look forward to that for future generations. Or I, maybe in Tokyo, corruption favors the building of transit, so maybe the corruption will turn that direction here and we'll get some... Uh, well, they're all privately funded there. Um, I remember this experience once of trying to learn the subway system, so I, I went over for a week just to do that. I, I got up at 8 in the morning and you know, get, just got on subway trains and stayed on them until five at night every, for, for seven days until I knew this, until I knew the system. And one morning, you know, one day I, 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 I got, I got off in, in the middle of the lingerie department, some department, <laughs> some department store, because that department store owns, owns that line. You know? Yeah, you can get off inside a department uh, store. Yeah. And, and so then I began to understand that they're all funded by, by individuals. Right. Well, most of them, most of the lines. Okay. Is that something just impossible to happen here? <laughs> I don't see it happening anytime soon. No, I don't think it could happen. There's too many regulations. And mm, yes. Nobody sees anything happening anytime soon here, but for some reason, we all still wait, because interesting things happen here anyway in this uh, in the city of Los Angeles, where I've been speaking today with James Steele. He is a professor here at the USC School of Architecture, author of many books, architectural books, monographs, and 20 years ago, the book, well, 21 years ago, the book Los Angeles Architecture, The Contemporary Condition came out, and it's one that, as you can see, I'm still thinking about today, and we can still talk about today. James, thanks so much. Thanks very much, Colin. I appreciate it. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themis Douglas Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andre Kadlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Blosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Wagelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright.